everyone in Puerto Rosa pretends to believe in sea monsters. <gasps> <laughs> well, I'm not pretending. Everybody, you are getting lost in plot, the show where we focus on story first, but not exclusively, across the mediums of film, television, video games, really anything with a story. I'm Wade, that's my brother Jake, and today we have Luca. So let's go get lost in plot. Fair warning, there are spoilers ahead. Here we go. Set in the seaside town on the Italian Riviera, Disney and Pixar's Luca is a coming-of-age story about a boy having an unforgettable summer. Luca shares the adventure with his friend, Alberto, but the fun is threatened by a closely held secret. They're both sea monsters from a secret world under the water's surface. So Luca is a sea monster that magically becomes a human when he's out of water. He's chasing freedom, but as always, freedom comes with risk. And like many Disney heroes before him, he wants to be part of our world. Now for Luca, freedom is a rusty old Vespa he can ride around on with his pal, Alberto. But in order to get one, they need to win first place in a local triathlon in a town obsessed with killing sea monsters. Along the journey, Luca discovers what he really wants is to go to school with other human beings. So there are familiar themes of self-discovery and taking the lead when chasing your dreams. But if I had to describe this story in one word, safe. But safe isn't necessarily bad, is it? I don't think so. Um, you know. I think with all ideas, you can take something derivative, a premise that we've seen a couple of times, but if you can make it work, it works. And isn't that what we all care about when we go see a story? Does it actually hold our attention? Do we enjoy ourselves throughout the time? I think that's what matters most. And the relationships are good. And you can see the, the Luca and Alberto relationship. There's three distinct parts in this film, both when they're riding, um, first it's the makeshift Vespa, and then two times later it's, it's the bike. And they're kind of spread out among the first act, second act, and the third act. Now, yes. in the first act, they're going off the, the turtle's back, off the ramp. Mm -hmm. And if you pay attention, you have to see Luca kicks Alberto free so they don't crash on the rocks. It's kind of him realizing, well, not realizing at the point, but if he follows him forward, they're going to crash on those rocks. It's not going to work out for either of them. Now, the second time is when Alberto is getting sensitive about Julia and their relationship. He's starting to get jealous. He doesn't have his loyal lackey to follow him around so he jumps on the bike and tries to say all you got to do is follow me follow my lead again that of course doesn't work out and then at the end of the film it's luca he's riding the bike himself he pulls alberto on the back and that's when they're finally successful they're both cross the finish line as sea monsters it's kind of that being true to yourself being honest about yourself self-discovery so the themes are kind of prevalent here but at the same time you know for a while i was first 10 minutes, I'm having flashbacks of The Little Mermaid. I'm having flashbacks of Finding Nemo. I'm having flashbacks of, you know, any number of Disney catalog films that we've got here. No, I agree. And I thought I had a bit of a rough first 10 minutes. There's nothing worse than when you try to do jokes or be charming and it doesn't quite land. The audience starts to cinch up and like, uh, we don't feel like we're in good hands. And we wonder, oh, is this going to be a disaster? How much farther is it going to go? But, um... You know, you, you correctly point out, here's what we're using in the imagery, here's what the Vespa means, here's how it parallels their relationship and the changes, therefore. These are people who know what they're doing, so let's find out who these people are. Talking about who wrote it, we've got Jesse Andrews and Mike Jones, a pair of writers on this Pixar film. Let's start with Mike Jones, because he's got a recent one. All right. Mike Jones is the writer of the last Pixar film to be released, Soul. What did you think of Soul? I skipped it. You skipped it entirely? Didn't see Soul whatsoever. Anytime Pixar does a movie where they have like little blob things instead of actual characters, I stopped. After Inside- There was a little blob thing. Yeah, after Inside, I stopped. It was too reminiscent of that movie, and I didn't like that movie. I want to say they were both directed by the same same director. There's kind of a crew in Pixar that they've got a creative team, they've got a, a batch of directors that they kind of cycle through and every now and then they pull someone new in. Uh, well, they can, they can just stop with the amorphous blob characters and I'll watch the next fair, one. Fair enough. Now, Mike Jones is on that creative team. Um, 
And Soul is his only credit as, as a writing credit, but he's on the, the senior creative team, if I remember right. Did you see Soul? I did see Soul. I did watch it, um, and I didn't like it. I didn't like it at all. The audience disagrees with me. It's at an 8.2, and I have it down at a 3. Oh, boy. Uh, the, to me, it was one of the worst Pixar movies I think I've ever seen. I don't think anything will you know, take away the basement spot from The Good Dinosaur. That's still on my list as just a train wreck of a Pixar film and the worst one that they've done. But I put Soul right right down there because it's just, it's such a mess on so many levels. I didn't get anything out of that, but I don't want to have this hijack our conversation. We're supposed to be talking about Luca. All right, well, Soul, what's next? That's in the past. So let's move over to Jesse Andrews, who's also credited on Luca here. Now his other Soul writing credit is Me, Earl, and the Dying Girl from 2015. Did you see that one? Nope. You didn't see that one either. That's adapted from a book. I thought that one was amazing. The audience has it as an, at an 8.1. I have it at an 8. That's a very high score for me. This was an amazing film. Nick Offerman's in it. Um, it's got a solid cast. It, it is one of those very extremely sentimental, emotional films. Um, it is about two friends and a girl suffering from cancer. That's what it sounds like. They're all in high school. Mm. Uh, but it's... It's really emotional and really packs a punch. I forget who directed that one, but it was just a, a terrific story. Um, the only... it, it made you cry. Did it make? He was I'm weepy. Trying to remember he was weepy at the end. He sniffled. He looked down at his popcorn. Oh. That was the exact scene that happened. I know it. It's like you were there, <laughs> even though you haven't seen. I know it wasn't. You there, haven't, haven't seen, seen either of these. I don't know what you're doing. I guess I'll. I'll well, you t I, I'm not going to watch Soul now. That you told me it's a three, but well, you know, you could be Earl and the Dying Girl. Yeah, maybe I'll watch that. That one's worth worth going to watch. Gonna make me cry. Yeah, cry for a little bit. You'll you'll enjoy it. Uh, Luca sitting at a seven point four with the audience. Thoughts about that? Reactions? That's, I think they have to consider that a win. Okay. So I know Mike Jones is on the creative team at Pixar. I'm, I'm kind of looking at this one as Jesse Andrews' baby. I know the story credit. There's some uh, a story credit with the director on, on Luca as well, but I, I'm I want to hinge most of it on Jesse Andrews. Maybe I'm wrong about that. We'll never know. Um, but anyway, that's our notable credits. Now I'm going to hand this one off to you, and you can just go break this story. Let's do it. So my one thing for Luca is the central relationship between the title character Luca and his companion Alberto. It sets up to show us how Luca, the millennial whose parents won't let him out of the front yard to go play, befriends Alberto, the wayward youth who has no parental supervision whatsoever. Together they form a bond based on their mutual curiosity and admiration for all things surface world, which includes Vespas, which the film uses as a symbol of their relationship. But what's most interesting is how the story drives the two apart. Alberto pretends to be an expert of the surface world, and the naive Luca relies on him for much of the early film. But once they make it to the seaside town, Luca has surface world experiences of his own, including befriending Julia, a human from that town. These things allow him to see Alberto as the fraud that he is rather than the expert he pretends to be. And this triggers Alberto's fear of abandonment, brought on by what his father did to him. Alberto's worried he's gonna lose his one companion if he's no longer useful to him. So he begins to resent the relationship between Luca and Julia. Now. This causes both characters to do rather despicable things to one another that's motivated by this fear and resentment. When Alberto tries to out Luca as a sea monster in order to ruin his relationship with Julia, and Luca cuts him off at the knees by treating him like a sea monster first. It's a nasty scene, it's hard to watch, but it sets up a final act where Luca abandons Julia to run the final race solo so he can win back the Vespa and rekindle his bond with Alberto. But it's Alberto who has the most poignant gesture at the end, when he sells that Vespa to purchase a train ticket to send Luca to the human school. This is a nice moment because it shows the emotional growth that Alberto has gone through. He's overcome his fear of abandonment to be secure in his attachments and his relationships. And the film even gives him a nice earned reward at the end when Julia's father takes him in and provides parental guidance and stability that he'd been lacking the entire film. So, of the three characters, I found Alberto's journey to be the most interesting and, for me, the beating heart of this story. 
You're absolutely right. I had the same reaction. He's really got the best character art of all three of these guys. Um, Luca, I didn't even think had that much of a character arc. He's chasing his dream. Yeah. He does realize that he needs to be in charge. He needs to take the lead here. But Alberto's got the most to learn and the most to change through this story. And I and I agree with you that that final gesture of giving up that Vespa, that freedom that they had dreamed together, because his friend Luca has a new dream, and it doesn't involve him. And he's found the strength enough to to let go and let him go on that's right um, he's become secure yeah. and you know luca he's all right but he's so derivative of the little mermaid that it's like hmm, not particularly interesting and julia doesn't learn a damn thing the entire well, movie. well it's that kid that jacob tremblay it's that voice of his i don't know about you is there a more earnest voice in the entire world in in all of hollywood actors like you can hear that kid say anything and it just sounds so earnest and idyllic and full of joy and wonder i <laughs> Which is a big fan of that voice. He Maybe likes it. it's me. I, it speaks it, to his inner child. It did something. I don't know. Uh, but I, I totally agree. Alberto's got the more interesting character. But you also hit another point, and that's what is the threat here? And it's the threat of being rejected, being treated like a sea monster, like you said. That's right. And that is really embodied by, and what did you think of? Hercule, our villain. Hercule! Hercule! What did you think of Hercule as a villain? Um, you know, I liked Hercule as a villain. I mean, he was... He was a douche, and you really oh, hated him. Jerk. You just wanted, wanted him to get his comeuppance, yeah. and um, that's exactly what you want. We've talked about villains that you love to hate, right? And they didn't pull a pinch on Urkele. You love to hate this guy. Yeah. And anytime he gets a comeuppance, it's very satisfying. So I thought he did his job. Did well. you find him a little one note as a villain, though? Like, he's he's that villain that, you know, yeah, the fear of rejection of society, and he embodies that just because he's a jerk. I don't know if there's much more to him than that. He's kind of a one-dimensional. I don't know that there needs to be. Here's the town more. jerk. He's going to treat everybody like crap, including you. And, you know, he's going to throw harpoons at you. You're going to have to deal with that. Hercule. Yeah, I think you're right. He doesn't get more dastardly as the film goes on. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't, he kind of, like, you see him and you're just like, man, that guy's a prick. And he stays that way. Yeah. Very, fairly level. Like, and he doesn't there's nothing beyond that. that, though. No, he doesn't right? get more dastardly. Like, oh, now you've done something even for a prick that I thought you'd never stoop to. Like, he just kind of stays there. But yeah. he does he does what he's supposed to do for the story. And to return to my comment about this film being being safe, I come to Luca, and, and I, comparison with him and Alberto again, is what did Luca really risk? When you're chasing your dreams to have a really compelling story where your, your lead character is like fighting for a dream, fighting for an ideal, they have to risk something or they have to sacrifice something. And when I look at Luca, it just seemed a bit too easy for me. You don't want to go with your Uncle Ugo into the depths of the ocean. You got a pretty boring, awful existence at home. Of course you want to go live on the surface world and ride Vespas and go have fun all day and then go to school. But what is he giving up? He's not really giving up any. He's giving up his parents. I don't even think he liked them anyway. <laughs> I wouldn't have liked him. Yeah, so like there's so, no sacrifice. That's why it feels too easy for him. It feel And this film overall feels safe because it's just, you know, not for Alberto. But is this film too safe? Let's find out in Dead or Alive. Dead or Alive. All right, so here we are, dissecting Luca. I'm gonna go first. For me, Luca, it's alive. It's alive and it is at a seven out of 10. I enjoyed my time with Luca. This is just kind of a, a light, easy story in a nice setting that I really liked visiting. It's like, it's supposed to be somewhat reminiscent of Chiquiterra in Italy. Mm -hmm. And it's fantastic. And all the Italian influence and they're serving up the pasta. I very much enjoyed it. The side characters from Julia's father to his cat to Arcole, which we mentioned, they're all pretty good. I didn't really like Luca's parents, but overall, most of the side characters were good. Now, would I describe this as an amazing film? No. To me, it's more like it's like a talented sprinter who's too raw, who's stumbling through the obstacle course. Do they get to the finish with a pretty decent time? Yeah. Was it pretty? No, it was not. Really? This was neither particularly clever at times when it seemed like it wanted to be, mm, no. and it took time and it took risks on jokes that didn't land. I don't know how many people kept laughing at Vespa references, but the first one I saw, I felt was like a throwaway. Oh, that's funny. You know, they're looking at the picture of the Vespa on the wall. I didn't realize it was going to be the focal point of the movie. And we'd have running Vespa jokes throughout. Yeah. Um, well, I, I enjoyed it as well. Um, and I'll, I'll say it was charming. I agree Very with you. Very charming. I, 
I don't know if it's kind of like stumbling through the hurdles as a runner and, and to use your, your metaphor, but for me, I, I felt like I got to the end of it and I wasn't sure if it did enough. Like it could have done more because I have those expectations from other Pixar films. Pixar films are some of my favorite of all time. Mm -hmm. um, you talk about uh, Toy Story, the original Toy Story. You talk oh. about Ratatouille. You talk about The Incredibles. There's just so many amazing Pixar films of late of late. There's some garbage ones too. Quality's really slipping of late with Pixar. Um, so this one kind of came in and I didn't know, is this going to be more of the downward trend or something really fun and worth my time? And I'll have to say, I'll go ahead. Uh, for me, this one is absolutely alive and I've got it right where you've got it at a 7 out of 10. I enjoyed it. I thought it was charming. I liked the characters. I liked the music. I wish it had done a little bit more to distinguish itself. Yeah, and I don't think it had the emotional catharsis. And this is what I get to with my point. I'm not really articulating it well, but I just feel like the people making this, they're good, but they weren't masters of their craft. They were reaching for things that they didn't quite get mm. to. And one of the things I point to is the emotional catharsis we're supposed to feel when Luke is on that train and he's like holding his arm out and catching the rain. And it's like, ah, oh, I'm on the train. I'm going to the humor. It's like, Buddy, you didn't, you didn't really go through much of an ordeal. Like you said, you didn't risk a whole heck of a lot. I thought it was more telling what we saw with Alberto. Sacrifice. Yeah. Sacrifice is a big thing in this kind of story, and without it, it just makes it lesser of a story. But I did like uh, wait, Alberto. I, I thought they did a good job developing his arc, where he fit at the end. He's missing a father. He gains a father. Uh, Massimo, I think his name is. Yeah. Massimo, something like Great that. Great character. I like is, him is missing an arm. He literally could use an extra hand to help him with all the fishing and all that. And, mm -hmm. you know, Alberto kind of comes in and fits perfectly. And uh, the cat, Machiavelli, had me had me laughing. Oh, everybody loves that cat. Uh, many it's times. Fantastic. So I did have fun. I did think it was charming. It doesn't reach the, the ultimate heights of Pixar, but I thought it was still more than passable. And I enjoyed it with the... Uh, with a 7 out of 10. Silencio Bruno? Silencio. Andiamo! Andiamo. Silencio, Silencio Bruno. Bruno. I mean, I roll up to the drive-thru and I see the bacon cheeseburger and I think, no, I shouldn't eat it. It's not going to be good for me. And then I just say, Silencio Bruno. And I order the thing. I, I hope it works out. I, I hope it works out too. Silencio. That's Bruno. good. One thing before we before we wrap up is just, what's the significance of being a sea monster then? And I think this kind of like comes back to your point about poking holes. It's like, the sea monster part is kind of a trivial existence. There's no real life or ecosystem. That there. first ten minutes, he's like a shepherd with that fish. It didn't There's land. not a whole lot of it believability made no sense. in that. It's like yeah. you're not giving up anything. It's this isn't a separate world. It wasn't fully realized. It wasn't even it's a fully kind realized. Of a, uh, yeah, it was just like that's the, like the best way I think area. Area. It, it, it was, was not fully very realized. Good. And I think that's why it's like we don't see him risking anything because he's leaving. You know, not much. There's. The, we, we see his parents, we see some fish, we see some neighbors. It's not really clear what he does and why he's a shepherd for fish, but they're kind of like giving them the fish later in the boat. Yeah, I don't even know why it's important that he's yeah. got his flock of fish. A lot of that didn't make sense. It kind of comes down to it. He's not giving much up, and that's why it doesn't have a higher score, but a 7 out of 10, still pretty good. Silencio Bruno. Silencio Bruno. All right, if you guys have your own thoughts about Luca, I'm sure you've seen it because it's pretty big film at the moment. Let us know in the comments down below. Yeah, Disney Plus. If you like this video, please feel free to subscribe. Leave us a thumbs up if you enjoyed it as well. And we will be back and see you on the next one.